Hello and welcome to another episode of the Giants of the Faith podcast. My name is Robert Daniels and I'm the host of this show. This is the podcast where we focus on individuals from the age of the church who've lived out their faith in a unique or interesting way. These are people who are giants in the history of Christendom, and each has earned a spot in my personal Christian Hall of Fame. This is episode 30, where we're continuing our look at the Reformers. We've already looked at the ultimate Reformer, Martin Luther, and the Reformation martyress, Lady Jane Grey. Now we're moving the lens to the Swiss Confederation and pastor, Reformer, soldier, Holdrich Zwingli. Zwingli was the original leader of the Swiss Reformation, and sometimes rival to Martin Luther. His Reformation arose almost simultaneous to Luther's, fitting as they were only born seven weeks apart, and in some ways his story parallels Luther's, but there were irreconcilable differences that continue to linger to this day. Holdrich Zwingli was born on January 1st, 1484, in Wildhouse, Swiss Confederation. Now I can almost guarantee you that I'm pronouncing his first name wrong. I couldn't find a reliable pronunciation guide online, and Schweizer Deutsch is not in my wheelhouse, which is why I'll refer to him as Zwingli from here on. His parents were Ulrich and Margaret, and they were successful peasant farmers in the Toggenberg region of St. Gallen, one of the Swiss cantons. As a child, Zwingli was sent to Basel to be educated. He learned Latin there, took an interest in music, and he was recruited by the Dominicans in Bern to join their order. But his father didn't approve, and so he went home and then enrolled in the University of Vienna in 1498. That didn't last long, and he was soon expelled from the school for reasons unknown. He re-enrolled in 1500 and then transferred to Basel to finish his education, where he earned his bachelor's in 1502 and master's in 1506. Before we get into the next bit of Zwingli's history, it's important to look at the political structure of the Swiss Confederation, which was completely unknown to me before I started researching for this episode. The old Swiss Confederation was composed of cantons, or states, that operated independently, but also in concert. The number of cantons varied, but it eventually reached 13. The Confederation brought about a period of relative peace and increased trade to the region. Its armies had the reputation of being almost unbeatable. Incidentally, the Switzerland that we know today is still officially called the Swiss Confederation, only it operates under a central federal system of government. So it's in this era of cooperative city-states that Zwingli rose to prominence. So back to Zwingli. The same year he graduated, 1506, he was ordained, and he gave his first Mass on September 29th in his hometown of Wildhouse. He was then posted as pastor in Glarus. Glarus was a military town and the capital of the canton, also known as Glarus. The Swiss Confederation was relatively poor and weak compared to its neighbors, but it did produce strong young men and therefore strong armies. These men were trained and formed into mercenary companies who would sell their services to other countries and kingdoms. Zwingli was originally not opposed to the mercenary system, but he was opposed to his countrymen hiring themselves out to the hated French and rather supported fighting for the Pope and his papal states. The Pope recognized Zwingli for his support, and Zwingli received an income for his efforts to sway Swiss opinion on the subject. Zwingli himself traveled with mercenary groups and served as chaplain through many battles. In 1515, the Swiss suffered a defeat at the Battle of Merignano at the hands of the French, which was a severe blow to Swiss pride and their reputation. Kind of surprising to me, this brought about a change in mood in Glarus, as popular opinion shifted away from supporting the Pope and to the French, who had just defeated them. As a result, Zwingli was kind of left in a tricky spot, as he had been very public in his support for the Pope. It was then that Zwingli began to re-examine his support for mercenary warfare altogether. He loved his country, and he hated the shedding of its blood for other kings' gold. He began to criticize the corruption that such service led to. Men's souls were tainted through the wanton violence, avarice, and pride that was the result. He believed that the whole country had begun to deteriorate spiritually. He preached from his pulpit in Glarus, The situation is very serious. We are already contaminated. Religion is in danger of ceasing among us. We despise God as if he were an old sleepy dog. 
Yet it was only by his power that our fathers overcame their enemies, because they went to war for their liberties and not for money. Now, puffed with pride, we pretend that nobody can resist us, as if we were strong as iron and our foes slack as pumpkins. He also published an allegory entitled The Labyrinth, which satirized the mercenary system that the Swiss had set up. This new attitude didn't sit well with the locals, so Zwingli decided retreat was in order, and he put in for a transfer to Eisendown, where he retreated from public life for a bit. But although Eisendown was a small village, his life there was not uneventful. First, he met Erasmus, the Dutch scholar and priest. After having read some of his works previously, he struck up a letter-writing friendship with the scholar, and he was influenced greatly by his works. Erasmus was a pacifist and a reformer, but he was interested in reforming the Catholic Church from within, not from without. Zwingli obtained a copy of Erasmus's Greek New Testament and copied out the Pauline epistles by hand. He carried them with him everywhere he went, and he memorized them. This very personal interaction with the Holy Scriptures was unusual in the 16th century, and Zwingli's nearness to them began to do a work on his soul. But let's not assume that Zwingli was an angel. He got into what he called a situation with the local barber's daughter. The situation was that he'd gotten her pregnant, while still a priest. Yeah. That did not stop Zwingli from being considered for a much more prestigious position in Zurich in 1518. When being interviewed for the new position, he came clean, sort of. Alas, I fell and became like the dog, he said, who, according to the Apostle Peter, turned back to his own vomit. But he rationalized that the girl was only the daughter of a barber, and no one important, and that she had seduced him. That was enough to satisfy Zurich, and on December 11th, 1518, he was ratified as the new priest for the city. It didn't hurt that Zwingli's only serious competition for the post openly lived with several mistresses, and had six illegitimate children. Not surprisingly then, Zwingli would soon begin advocating for the reversal of the policy on priestly celibacy. He later wrote, Out of one hundred, nay, out of one thousand, there is scarcely one chaste priest. Zwingli moved to Zurich, and on January 1st, 1519, he preached his first sermon there. And this sermon was like no other the Zurichers had ever heard. Typically, the priest would give a homily on whatever feast or important date was near. Instead of following tradition, Zwingli began preaching through the New Testament, first through Matthew, then Acts, Timothy, Galatians, Peter, Hebrew, John, and the other Pauline epistles. He then turned his attention to the Psalms and the Pentateuch, and the historical books of the Old Testament. This was radical. Most of his listeners had no familiarity with the Bible. Heck, most priests had very little themselves. He took his pastoral duties seriously. He wrote, Though I was young, ecclesiastical duties inspired in me more fear than joy, because I knew, and I remain convinced, that I would give account of the blood of the sheep which would perish as consequence for my carelessness. Though he himself had many failings, he took upon himself the great task of shepherding well the flock that had been placed under him. In addition to preaching through the Bible, he also returned to the subject that had caused him so much grief in Glarus, Swiss mercenary activities. But in Zurich, he had a friendlier reception. Zwingli spoke so powerfully and eloquently against the practice that the city council of Zurich voted to end it in the city. Zwingli also began to speak out against the abuses of the church. He opposed the moral corruption of the priests, which was ironic, and even attacked the veneration of the saints. He rejected the authority of the Pope to excommunicate believers, and even rejected mandatory tithing. His radical messages stirred up some resistance from city leaders, but never enough for them to challenge his position. Zwingli responded to all criticism by stating that he was simply preaching from the scriptures. Now, this was all happening in concert with the waves that Luther was making up in Germany. But Zwingli, at this point, had never even heard Luther's name, and so we call the movement in Switzerland an independent co-reformation. That same year, the Bishop of Constance was offering indulgences for sale to help fund the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. A man named Sanson was tasked with soliciting contributions in exchange for the indulgences. When Sanson arrived at Zurich's city gates, the people looked to Zwingli for guidance on how to respond. At Zwingli's advice, Sanson was denied entry and was forced to return to the bishop empty-handed. 
1519 was notable in one other way for Zwingli and Zurich. An outbreak of plague ravaged the city beginning in August, killing about 25% of the populace. As many as could afford it left the city for the countryside to escape, but Zwingli stayed behind. He continued his preaching and his pastoral duties, and in September, he contracted the disease himself. Zwingli was near death when he wrote his famous Plague Hymn, which is divided into three, four stanza sections. He wrote the first four when he contracted the illness, the next four as his health crumbled and he suffered for three months, and the final four as he recovered. Once fully recovered, Zwingli led two relatively uneventful years continuing in his duties. He was elected to become canon at the Grossmunster Cathedral. This new position brought him prestige and made him a full citizen of Zurich. The relative harmony didn't last, however. March 9th, 1522 brought the infamous Sausage Supper and the beginning of the Swiss Reformation. Now there are conflicting details in various sources around this affair of the sausages, but the central facts remain the same. Christopher Froschauer was the town printer in Zurich, and he and his staff had just completed printing a new edition of Paul's epistles. To celebrate the completed work, Froschauer threw a little dinner party for his workers. He also invited Zwingli and several other city luminaries. At this dinner, Froschauer served various sausages, among other things. Now, where controversy comes into play is it was Lent, and it was illegal to eat meat. Not just frowned upon, but actually illegal. Zwingli was there, but he didn't eat, though some sources say he participated in the distribution of the sausages. The public was outraged, and their outrage prompted the arrest of Froschauer. And that arrest prompted Zwingli to mount the pulpit that Sunday and preach his famous sermon titled, on the choice and freedom of foods. In this sermon, Zwingli argued that Lent is found nowhere in Scripture. He said that the church was adding all of these restrictive rules that were nowhere to be found in the Bible. Fasting and even the observance of Lent were to be personal decisions made by the individual and could never be prescribed by the church. Zwingli walked his church through Matthew 11, which reads in part, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Zwingli was discovering that the Catholic Church had replaced the simplicity of Scripture with a seemingly never-ending confusion of unnecessary rules and burdens on the populace. And it was at this point that he began to speak out and use his position to advance the true gospel. The Sausage Supper wasn't the only controversy that Zwingli was involved in in 1522. He also secretly married Anna Reinhardt, a widow who had three children. Zwingli had been tutor and patron to Anna's children, and she was one of his most committed parishioners. Priests were, of course, forbidden to marry and had taken vows of celibacy. To try and resolve this issue, Zwingli wrote a letter, along with ten other ministers, to the Bishop of Constance, requesting a change in church policy that would allow priests to marry. His request was denied, of course, and Zwingli was in full-on rebellion against the church. He resigned his position as priest, but he was retained as preacher by the city council. And that's where we will close part one of our look at Zwingli. We'll conclude the story in the next episode. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate every download and listen. If you have any comments or corrections, Send them along to podcast at giantsofthefaith.com. Until next time, God bless.